Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Genesis. We're in chapter 45 this week, and we'll be um, finishing chapter 45. Uh, we're studying the life of Joseph, and last week we read about the high point in the story of Joseph's life. Now, we've gone through many ups and downs in Joseph's life, uh, as his chart shows, the different story arcs, the different houses in which he's, he's been in. And throughout the narrative of his ups and downs, we've seen that Joseph's had been faithful to God. And then more importantly, God has been faithful to, jo to Joseph, orchestrating the events of his life for a greater good. And we are studying the final section concerning Joseph's life where there are a number of subplots. Uh, the first subplot was the uh, visit from the ten brothers to Egypt to buy food, uh, where they encountered a disguised Joseph. Uh, they were sent home with a requirement of bringing Benjamin back with them. Uh, when they went home and, dis and discussed what happened uh, to their father, their father refused to let Benjamin go, but after some time and the requirements uh, of, of a lack of food, reluctantly, Jacob allowed Benjamin to go with them. Uh, when they re reunited, returned uh, with all 11 brothers, Joseph was finally reunited with his full brother, and they all feasted together, which uh, led, Joseph's, uh, led to Joseph's predicament of how does he keep his brother there with him, uh, which led us to the fourth uh, story arc, which is the two plans, where Joseph was going to plant evidence into Benjamin's uh, sack of grain, incriminating evidence that so he can accuse him of theft, so he can keep him in Egypt and send the rest of them back. Uh, but the second plan was that Joseph begs that he be taken instead, so that, number one, his father should not suffer further harm, and then, number two, that he should keep his word. And this unexpected event and information forces Joseph to reveal his identity. Uh, and we see the God Almighty granting them compassion and Joseph was released to them. His identity, his, his relationships was released. So that prayer that Jacob had prayed way back here was answered, number one, with the release of Simeon, but also, number two, with the release of Joseph. Um, so uh, in that story uh, where Joseph is being released and the brothers are being uh, reconciled together, we see the chain of, of forgiveness and reconciliation, which included the, uh, the original offense and hurt, then we saw that the hurt party had to forgive. Uh, and then the, the, the party that offended had to turn about with true repentance, which included confession and a changed life. And then the one that was offended needed to then receive them. Where there was going to be, uh, in, it was done in a private way. It was done where there was honesty and there was comforting, comforting words, uh, friendly words. And then finally, uh, the goal of reconciliation is life together, shared life together. Now, also in that chapter, the passage that we studied last week, verses 1 through 15, there was two emphases going on. Number one, uh, right at the beginning in verse 3, where Joseph is revealing his identity, he says, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? So we see immediately his concern and the emphasis is on his father. And then the, the whole third section is about instructions to bring back his father into Egypt from Canaan. And Joseph gives that invitation where he emphasizes, number one, that he has authority in Egypt. Number two, that when Jacob moves down, he'll be lived near Joseph. There'll be a proximity there, and they can share life together. And then number three, that Joseph will be a provider, could provide for all of his needs there in Egypt. And then number, uh, the second thing he does as part of the instructions to bring Jacob back down is to tell his brothers to be a testimony of, of his authority, what he is, and, um, and the goodness that he has there. Uh, so uh, this is the unresolved issue which we were left with at the end last week. Uh, so this week we'll read about moving the house of Jacob. Genesis 45, verse 16 through 46, seven, verse 7, where we're going to consider three stages of the, moving the house of Jacob to Egypt. Now, the first stage is the provisions for the journey. 
And the first part of that, we see the generosity of Pharaoh. Verse 16 reads, Now when the news was, was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Now remember, uh, Pharaoh's house had already knew that something emotional was happening with Joseph. Because at the beginning of the chapter, uh, they heard from the outside Joseph's loud weeping. Uh, and so it was reported to them. And so naturally, they would be curious, and not just curious, but demand to know if Joseph was okay. He was the, the second in command of all of Egypt, uh, and he had a very important job to do. So it would be natural that the house of Pharaoh would inquire as far as what had happened. And now they know it. And that news of his brothers coming down, it pleased both Pharaoh and his servants. Now, when we say his servants, it's not his butler, uh, things like that. It is his officials. So his official court was pleased. And the word pleased, I've highlighted it because in this first section, uh, the word that's used, the root is tov in, in Hebrew. It means good. And it's repeated four times in this section. Verses 15 through 23. And it, it just communicates over and over again that there are good things in Egypt, both good attitudes and good resources that are ready for God's people. And God has arranged this together uh, so they could receive from that. There's nothing hostile there. There's only good things. Now, unlike Moses' original readers who were slaves in Egypt and don't really have warm, good, fuzzy feelings towards Egypt... Here, everything is good. God has orchestrated it that way for Israel to come into great blessings, uh, where they'll be welcomed and honored in Egypt. So Pharaoh's generosity can be seen in two spheres. Uh, first, verse 17 and 18, it says, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households and, and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. And you will eat the fat of the land. So number one, Pharaoh will provide food. There's food provisions here in Egypt for them. Uh, and this is food now with the donkeys being uh, loaded up with provisions and a promise of the best food in the land of Egypt. Now we have to remember that we are in two years in a seven-year famine. So to say that I'm going to give you not just food, but the best food of all of Egypt, that gives a great status, great honor, great respect. And then secondly, verses 19 and 20, Pharaoh gives moving considerations. And 19 and 20 say, Now you are ordered, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives, and bring your father and come. Do not consider yourselves with your goods, uh, for the best of all of the land of Egypt is yours. So his considerations here are for wagons for people. Uh, and that, those wagons, they're going to be pulled by oxen or some kind of animals. And they would probably need servants as well to drive them. Remember that the other brothers, they're, they're guiding their own donkeys that are filled with grain. So this is a, a huge gift. Uh, wagons with goods and treasures and uh, provisions and servants and animals. Now look at this thought. Uh, Pharaoh is not just thinking, yeah, bring him down. He's thinking, he's going a step further. What would they need? What would their, how can I make their trip enjoyable, pleasurable, uh, the best that they can? He's giving consideration. Now pr in a practical manner, women and children and the elderly would slow down the moves. So the wagons here, they, they are a special consideration. But not only that, they show a special value and status of children and women and the elderly to honor them and to, to treat them kindly uh, with thoughtfulness. And Pharaoh says, don't, don't be concerned yourself with your, with your goods. Uh, you, you, know, you uh, can have anything you want down here. Uh, so don't, don't take a lot of time to pack everything up. You can have the best and brand new things here. Leave your old stuff there, uh, and we'll give you new things. Now, notice the beginning here. It says, now you are ordered. That you there is singular. So it's referring to Joseph. Now, now you, Joseph, are ordered. And say this. Do this. Take 
the wagons from the land of Egypt for your plural, your little ones. And the rest of the yours are all plural, referring to the brothers, the whole family. Uh, and it shows that although he is ordering Joseph and Joseph to say this, Pharaoh is really viewing them all as one unit. Uh, you can see uh, the family unit as being one. Um, now, we need to ask the question, why is Pharaoh so generous? Uh, this is, he's taking a personal interest. I mean, remind you, this is the leader of the largest and most powerful nation in the world, and yet he's taking a personal interest here. Well, number one, this is God's doing. God is granting favor in the eyes of Pharaoh uh, towards Israel, towards Jacob and his sons. He's granting them grace. And then number two, Pharaoh here, Sennacherib the third, he's witnessing firsthand the reality of his father's dreams uh, and Joseph's interpretation and the wisdom that God had given him about those dreams. Uh, and that was given to them by Yahweh, Joseph's God and Jacob's God. And this wisdom and these dreams, it's literally saving his nation. Thousands and thousands of people are being saved. Uh, so these, these acts of generosity and thoughtfulness, they come out of honor for Joseph and his integrity and how he was being used uh, by God to save people and to save lives. Okay, so that is the generosity of Pharaoh. So next we move to the equal generosity of Joseph, verses 21 through 23. So th we just read about the personal invitation of the greatest world leader of the time, and then Joseph adds even more toward to that when he says, that, Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for the journey. To each of them he gave changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave 300, 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. Now first here in these two verses, notice that they've identified them as the sons of Israel. Now, that has overtones of a nation. And you can see, uh, that you can hear in those words that a nation is moving down into Egypt. Uh, and they are complying with Pharaoh's desires, his wishes. Uh, the sons of Israel, they did so. And then we see Joseph obeying. Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh. He's, he's obeying the instructions of, of Pharaoh completely. But he also adds... Uh, first to his brothers, he adds, and gives them clothing. Now, why a change of clothing? Uh, there could be a, probably a number of reasons. Number one, uh, it, it shows a new status of their brothers as being a relative to the second most powerful man in Egypt. So their status is now automatically changed to being in a high status, a high position. But in a very practical way, their garments, when, it, when the word garments is used here, it harkens back to chapter 44, verse 13, where when uh, Joseph was enacting his plan to frame Benjamin, they found the, the silver cup in his sack. The brothers tore their clothes. And when each of them loaded, uh, unloaded, uh, loaded his donkey, they returned to the city. So there, remember, their garments were all, all torn as a sign of mourning and of sorrow. Uh, and so... There's not much time between that event and this event when they're going home. So Joseph is replacing the clothing that really he was responsible for them ripping and tearing. Uh, so in a literary fashion, though, this is basically saying by replacing the mourning garments, it's saying that the mourning is done. The sorrow is done. Grief is done. And now there's new clothing and new life uh, here. And it's very ironic given the whole story because the one whose garment that had many colors was torn from him is now the one that is actually providing better clothing to his brothers, to those whom uh, took from him. Uh, and it shows in a really real way forgiveness. It's, it's a repeated theme of that forgiveness and not harboring resentment or bitterness, but being generous and giving which is the nature of forgiveness, of God's forgiveness. So we need to also ask, why does Benjamin receive more? 
Well, it shows his favorite status being Joseph's full brother. And that's a reality. That is just a reality. There does not have to be, nor is there in reality, fairness. Uh, Joseph is elevated, and his brother is elevated because he is his full brother, and the others are not. And as we saw earlier, uh, they, they, do not, they are mature enough now where they don't have that jealousy. Now, in addition, it may be possibly uh, compassion on Joseph's side showing compensation for their relationship that was stolen from him from the last 22 years and giving him extra uh, as a blessing and then a gift, making up for lost time. Uh, so here uh, we see them giving, uh, Joseph giving his brothers garments, but Joseph also gives provisions to his father. Verse 23 says, uh, To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the best things uh, of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and sustenance for his father on the journey. Now, to me, when I first read this, this is interesting or odd, because why do you send ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt to only have to turn right around and carry them back? Well, part of that answer is, in relaying the messages to their father, report, giving the report about Joseph, having rest from their long trip, this is over 350 miles, and deliberating and planning on the move and how that's going to happen, and, and then packing. That all takes time. You don't move in a day. So all of these things, he can enjoy them and remember, uh, and it acts as a testimony until that time when they move back. Uh, it, it shows... Uh, that they, Joseph is trying to uh, give a testimony and, and show honor and love and respect to his father by giving gifts. It's interesting because his father did the same thing uh, to show honor to his brother Esau. Uh, and so Joseph, probably seeing that from his own father, his past, and doing it in return. So also notice there's ten, ten donkeys, presumably male, and then ten female donkeys. You know, why, why even mention that? Well, number one, this, this gift, number one, allows breeding. It, it, there's ten pairs. So now he has the means to produce even more. And donkeys at that time were like automobiles. They were expensive and they were uh, costly and not everyone had them. So he had his very makings of, of great wealth. And then number two, females can provide milk. Uh, so there was, there was a lot there uh, in the value of, of 20 donkeys. But then also they were loaded up with provisions. And it wasn't only provisions for the trip up. He also took care of the provisions for the way back. Uh, and really, uh, Joseph is giving Jacob no reason, no excuse, no hesitation as to coming to Egypt. And that brings us to the, the second stage of moving Jacob to Egypt, which is the actual journey back to Canaan by the brothers. Um, so if you think about it, the caravan that's returning to Canaan had at least 31 donkeys, the 20 that Joseph was giving and the 11 that the brothers took down in the first place, then multiple carts with more animals, uh, possibly 12 carts, one for each family, because each family had, each brother had a wife and children. Uh, and then there's also Jacob, that makes 12. So this is a huge caravan coming back. And verse 24 recur, records the first, uh, before they leave, it says, so he, Joseph, sent his brothers away. And as they departed, he said to them, do not quarrel on the journey. Fascinating little thing. He, he's sending them on their way, and here's the last final instructions as far as their trip, trip is concerned. And the word there for quarrel means don't be stirred up, don't be angered. Uh, and there's a little bit of debate as far as what this means, but all the ancient translations uh, and texts, they're very consistent, which associates this being quarreled with the revelation that Joseph didn't die, 
but was in fact sold into slavery. And I, we need to remember that, number one, Reuben and Benjamin had no idea about that. And so this, on this trip home, this would be the first time they'd be like, now you guys, you guys kept this from me for how many years? You can see how they could, they could start blaming one another. Uh, already in the past, when they first encountered Joseph, we saw Reuben blaming them, remember, and saying, I knew this was going to happen. I told you not to do that to the boy. Uh, so that could happen again. And Joseph's trying to say, stop it. But then also, number two, this whole situation brings up the necessity of telling their father what they did. Dad, we, we did it. And none of them were innocent except for Benjamin because they all had plans of what to do with Joseph. So they have to make that known to their father, which wouldn't be pleasant either. And I don't know if they could easily come into a fight as far as you need to say it. No, no, you do. You're, you're, you're to blame. You can easily see how a fight could, ha- could start. And uh, this is a kind encouragement from Joseph. And his goal is here is to maintain family unity. They've just now reconciled. And they're all together and they're showing great harmony and great love for one another. And he doesn't want that to fall apart. And we need to remember and realize that's Satan's ga- uh, game. That's his ultimate goal is to tear apart families, not to bring them back together again. So by Joseph saying this, it's a reminder of his emphasis and God's emphasis of the family staying together as one and being harmonious. Well, moving on, it says, Then they went up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan and to their father Jacob. And they told him, saying, Joseph is, is still alive, and indeed, he is ruler over all of Egypt. But he was stunned, and he did not believe them. So Jacob has an initial shock from the news of, number one, that Joseph is alive, and number two, that he's a ruler of Egypt. The word for stunned there, it literally means that his heart grew weary, or his heart grew numb. He couldn't even entertain the possibility it was so remote, so ridiculously sounding that he's like, come on, stop it. Uh, you're kidding. It's, not, it's not, not possible. A, it's not possible that he's alive. And then B, he's actually a, a, a ruler of Egypt. So the next step was to give more evidence. Verse 27 says, when they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry, uh, to carry him, the spirit of his father, Je- uh, Jacob, revived. So they had to give more evidence. They give their testimony, and then they give Joseph's words, his, his, te- his invitation, and showed him the actual physical things. Now, when it says that all the words of Joseph, if the brothers were communicating all the words of Joseph, then we know for certain that they did tell Jacob that they sold Joseph because that was part of Joseph's words. That they sold him into slavery. So they had to confess that. Uh, But it it was a combination of Joseph's words and the wagons. When he saw the actual expensive wagons with animals attached, probably oxen, probably servants, and then filled with the goods from Egypt, the sons could not have brought that back. They couldn't have conjured that up. Uh, they couldn't have, that couldn't have come from their own, so it had to come from someone powerful. It was that much wealth uh, that it had to come from a ruler. Uh, notice the, con- the contrasting language here, which we find throughout the Old Testament about numbness of heart. I remember the word for stunned is being numb. The heart was numb and didn't believe. That goes together. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, those who are disobedient have Hard hearts, numb hearts, ones that are not soft and they don't believe. And then notice the difference. The spirit of their father, when he did believe, it was revived. Really, literally means came back to life, had a new heart, new thinking, new faith. And you see that throughout the Old Testament uh, where uh, one who has faith has a new heart. Created me, oh God, a, a new heart. Give me new hope, new life. So the good news of Joseph being alive, it far outpowered the news uh, of what his sons did. And that is the reaction that that Jacob gives. Verse 28 says, Then Israel said, It is enough. 
My son, is, son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Now, this is an amazing thing because we've all been dreading and we knew the reaction of, of Jacob as far as the false information about Joseph being killed. Uh, and so we would, we would expect, especially if we were in his shoes, a negative reaction. You did what? You lied to me all these years? We don't see any of that. Any of that. Uh, and nor do we see, whoa, look at all this money. Look at all this wealth. What's, what's the text focused on? What is his words focused on? Above all the gifts, the provisions, uh, and the deception, the hurt from the past, uh, or, or the status of Joseph now, life was the most important thing. Life. And so he says, I, it's enough. That alone is the news that gives me new life. My son is not dead, he's alive. And, and I can, uh, that alone. But then he says, my greatest desire now is to be part of my son's life. To have that reunion, have that relationship. And he says, I will go and see him before I die. Now this is not saying that he's expecting to die anytime soon. But what he's saying here is that's now a new priority of his, while he still has life, that is his A number one priority. That is what he needs to do, is to go see his son. So you see that life, the relationships, is such a great value that Joseph, uh, I'm sorry, that Jacob would move for. Uh, anything else, uh, Joseph having authority, being able to provide, uh, giving a place that's near him, the testimony of sons, none of that ultimately mattered. It was that Joseph was alive. That's enough for me, I will move. So this brings us to this third stage of moving the house of Jacob to Egypt. And that is the actual journey, the journey to Egypt. Uh, in chapter 46, verses 1 through 7. Now in the first part of that, we see the confirmation uh, from God. Verses 1 through 4. Verses 1, st- 1 starts off by saying, So Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to God, uh, the God of his father Isaac. Now the photo there is what the uh, a satellite photo or, or aerial photo of the, the mound, the ancient city of Beersheba, and uh, what's left of it. Uh, and we know that uh, Jacob is living in the area of Hebron. We don't know if it's north, south, east, or west, or around there, and he's, moving, and he's going down just this far. And it's only about 24 miles from the actual city of Hebron to Beersheba. Uh, and he stops there and he offers sacrifices to God. Why? Why does he do that? And why is it important for the text here? Why is he seeking God at this point? Well, there's a number of reasons as well, and a number of very important reasons. Okay, number one, he's setting out on a major journey. So he, he desires God's blessings. So he's offering a sacrifice. Now we know from Genesis 25, 26, that Isaac built an altar there in Bathsheba. Uh, so we know it's there. And the road, if you can see, there's a road here. This is the major road down to Egypt. And f- once you cross Beersheba, this part of the road, it's all desert. There's nothing else. So if you to get provisions, uh, water, things like that, Beersheba is your last day station, your last oasis. And that's what made it a great city for those traveling north. It was a city for rest and, and getting new provisions. And third, Beersheba was a pro- proverbially known as the southernmost point in Israel. Uh, and, and oftentimes in the Old Testament, you'll, see, you'll hear the phrase from Dan to Beersheba, from the most northern city to the most southern city, meaning all of Israel. So uh, what that's telling us here is he is now at the border. So if he goes any further, he's going out of the land of Israel. Uh, and, and notice that he's offering sacrifices to the, to the God of his father, Isaac. Why does it mention Isaac here? Well, if we go back to Genesis 26, let me read this passage. Now, there was a famine in the land. Sound familiar? Besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerard, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you, and sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give 
all of these lands. And I will establish an oath, which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and will give your descendants all of these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, which is a passage that's used of Christ in Galatians by Paul. Verse 5, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. What This meeting between God and Isaac surely was passed down to Jacob. And look at some of the elements there. God's blessing them because of Abraham's obedience. Well, if I was one of those sons, I would try to also be blessed and try to obey God in his words. And God is going to obey them, I'm sorry, going to bless them in the land. And by reading this, it says that your descendants will be like the stars of the heaven, and I will give you descendants of these lands. What does that imply? It implies, and rightfully so, we would just assume that God's going to keep them in that land and multiply them in that land. And so by Jacob leaving that land, is he being disobedient to God? Is he saying, God, I, I don't really trust you. I'll have to go because there's earthly provision. So you can see also Beersheba, the town, it means the well of oath. A promise. And it's the same word for oath that's used here. So it's very possible that the, the t- city name recalls in Jacob's mind this story from his father. So leaving the promised land may seem like unbelief. And hadn't God already, but, but hadn't God already arranged everything in Egypt for him and his children and his grandchildren to move there? What's God's will? So Jacob needs confirmation. Uh, and notice here, I think Jacob did this purposely. He stopped here because if God gave him direction, he would stay. His greatest earthly desires to be with his son and all the blessings there as well. A provision monetarily, uh, land, food, being with his son, and with his whole family being provided for. What greater desire would there be? And yet, he, he's seeking God's direction and confirmation because he's not going to move without God. Because without God, even when everything seems rosy, without God and his, his guidance, his blessing, he will have nothing. It's an example of him loving God more than fill in the blank. Verse 2 says, God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Now when God says, Jacob, Jacob, he's calling him as one calls a servant. And Jacob answers correctly. He answers properly by saying, here I am. This is a profound statement about the fundamental relationship between God and his people. Because it communicates an acknowledgement that he hears God and that he exists to be or do anything that God wants. This is a master-servant language where the servant or slave is being faithful and says, Basically, yes, master, I'm here. I'm here for your bidding. I'm here for you, for your will. That's fascinating in scriptures. uh, The greatest heroes from the Old Testament are are called this way. And they're also called slaves of Yahweh. Abraham, in Genesis 22, 11, uh, God's angel said, Abraham, Abraham, and he answered, here I am. Later on, Moses, in Exodus 3, 4, from the burning bush, God says, Moses, Moses, and he says, here I am. And then in 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, Samuel as well. God says, Samuel, Samuel. And he says, here I am. It's a pattern of God's servants knowing who they are. They are created uh, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever um, by doing and being what their God says. So, Jacob will, by saying, here I am, he's ready to serve, to go or to stay. Basically, he's saying, Lord, make your will be known. And verse 3, God says, I am God, 
the God of your father, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. And I will go down with you to Egypt. And I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. So in these words, in this revelation, God communicates four things. Number one, he, he, identif- he communicates his identity. I am God, and I'm the same God as your father. I'm the same one. The same one that made that promise to him. Number two, uh, he, he communicates comforting words. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. You're not being disobedient. And then explains why. He, why he doesn't need to be afraid, which is the covenant reaffirmation. Uh, he, he's reaffirming the covenant promises. And number one, for I will make you a great nation there. Now remember, in those other passages, it's just assumed that he's going to, because he's going to give them the land of Canaan, that he's going to make them a great nation there. Obviously not. And it's a little, it's a little play on words here, because I'm going to make you a great nation within a great nation, which is fascinating. That great nation's resources and wealth are going to be applied, provided for you and given to you. Uh, and so we see this is that expectation uh, that Israel was supposed to be multiplied within the land of, of Canaan is, is something that we just assumed, and that wasn't necessarily God's plan. Does that happen? Does God promise us things, and we have certain expectations in how he's going to fulfill that? And certainly, if Jacob said, no, God, I'm going to stay, you know, the rest of the Bible might look quite different. Uh, we, we need to trust God on how to get there as well. It may not be the way we expect. Secondly, he said, I will go down uh, with you. That communicates blessing. If God is with you, he is going to be gracious to you. Uh, he's, he's there in relationship and there to uh, make your way straight and give you peace, give you his joy. And number, f- uh, number three, it says, and I will also surely bring you up again. Now, this in Hebrew is very, very emphatic. We're saying, I, I'm the one. He actually repeats it. I'm going to bring you back. And you back, you can see how he's, he's, call, he's talking to Jacob, but he's referring to the whole nation of Israel. Back up. And that points to the Exodus. And here, the way it's written, it's so emphatic, it's gonna, it, it implies that he's going to do something special to do that. And then finally, it says, and Joseph will close your eyes. Uh, this communicates a reunion for the rest of his days. Uh, that... Jacob, once you go down there, you will live at peace with your son for the rest of your days. And that he will be there when you die. uh, And he will close your eyes. Uh, This is in great contrast to Jacob's fears. Which in 37, 35, it says, And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. For his father wept for him. That's when he thought that Joseph was dead. What a huge change and turn around by the end. So now, the final verses. We come to the journey accomplished. I'm going to read those uh, three verses. In verse 5 it says, Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, once he had that confirmation, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry them. And they took their livestock and their property, uh, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and came to Egypt and Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons and his grandsons with him, and his daughters and his granddaughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. And now this would be a huge caravan, a huge moment, uh, momentous mass of people coming down and things coming down. We actually know the Bible in Genesis and Exodus, uh, sorry, in Acts tells us there's 75 people all, but Add the animals, the other servants that Pharaoh sent up, uh, the flocks. This is a huge mass coming down. Uh, and they're, they're traveling some 300 miles. So this journey would take, take time, especially with all the animals. And you can see here that the sons, when Pharaoh and Joseph, they gave them wagons for special provisions, they didn't take them for themselves. 
They weren't selfish, right? They were men of honor as well, and they used those provisions for their, as they were intended to be used, valuing, showing special consideration to women and children and the elderly. Uh, and the, the text here, uh, it emphasizes that all of his descendants came down. Uh, did you notice that it says his daughters? Besides Dinah, remember, we don't have any indication about daughters. Uh, remember, there was one about him being comforted, and we, said, we suggested that could be the, the other brother's wives or it could be his other daughters. And, and I, I think it, it, it means other daughters as well, but this would surely also mean the wives of his, of his sons, but, but also that he had other daughters. Uh, so it emphasizes that Jacob's family came down as one family. Again, the text is emphasizing the union and harmony of the family and that God had provided for everyone in Jacob's house. And now they will live in, in Egypt and equally be provided for. So the big problem in the text that is clarified for us is why has Israel moved to Egypt when God has promised and given them the land of Israel? This answers that big problem, that big question. Uh, and remember, who's the original audience? It's Moses at that time in the Exodus. And they're having a, a terrible time in slavery and then a more difficult time leaving that and starting a new life and being in the wilderness. Uh, and so this is an important part of their history that they need to know. This passage shows that it was God's sovereign hand that orchestrated this move and made them into a, a great nation. And he brought them down there into plenty. And he gave them favor with the Egyptians. Uh, and he confirmed that move to Jacob. But also that he confirmed that he himself would be the one that would be powerful and bring them back. Uh, now there's one more reason before we, we, we close. There's one more reason why this is so important. This move is so important. And it's a, a reason from history. And it has to do with this stone. Uh, this is called the Sebeku Stela, which is also known as the Stela of Ke Sabak. And the inscription on this is in honor of a man named Sebeku, who lived during the reign of Senusaret III, which is the Pharaoh at this time. Uh, and the text is larger, largely about uh, Sebeku's life. And uh, it's in historically important because it records the earliest military campaign of Egypt going into the land of Canaan. Uh, the, the text reads uh, that then Sek Sekmem fell together with the wretched retinue. And where it says uh, Sekmem, uh, that is the word for Shechem, which is the, the Hebrew city. And remember, that was a city in which Jacob and the family had dealings with. And, and why this is important is that somewhere after this time, after Jacob had already moved to Egypt, at some point in the near future, because this pharaoh didn't live much longer, sometime Egypt mounted a huge military campaign and went through the land, taking and destroying and remember, that land was ripe for the picking because after two years, five years, seven years of famine, they'd be in trouble. Uh, f financially in trouble, provisions, food, everything. They'd be ripe for the picking. Uh, and so there'd be an easy military conquest. And what would happen if Jacob was still in that land? He'd be right in the path of the army uh, and, and probably taken. So here we see again God's protection. God's protection. So now let's move to uh, applications. Number one, Pharaoh's gestures of generosity and thoughtfulness uh, emerge from his honor for Joseph and are extensions of God's gracious hand to his people. In them, the women, the children, and the elderly are shown special value in considerations of kindness. In adding to Joseph's gener uh, into Pharaoh's generosity, Joseph gives further provisions to account for his father's knee, every need and to alleviate any possible fear or hesitation. Are our lives characterized by tenderness towards the needs of those who may be weaker than ourselves so that we also can be used as God's gracious hands? 
Number two, Joseph instructs his brothers not to quarrel and thus to maintain the unity in the family. Satan works to destroy unity. Uh, This scheme of our enemy is something that we need to be aware of and to make every effort to fight against. God's desire and his design for a holy family is unity. Uh, Number three, although Jacob saw the status, the wealth, and the authority of Joseph, uh, his words reflect uh, reflect what is truly important, which is Joseph's life. Life and relationships are far more precious. Uh, This is a value Jacob would leave his home for and move hundreds of miles away. God's people need to pursue life and relationships over wealth and status. Number four, over all of his greatest desires, Jacob sought God's blessing and guidance as to whether he should move to Egypt. Uh, He's an example of a faithful and submissive servant who loves the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, and strength. In his response to God's vision, uh, Jacob reveals to to us our proper attitude towards God, one that recognizes that we are his creations for his use, for his purpose, and for his glory. In your prayers this week, speak back these words to God and telling him, I am here. Number five, as most of us would assume when reading about the covenant promises of God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God was going to build a nation in the land of Canaan. But as his words to Jacob revealed, this was not the case. He gave further clarification. So it reminds us that God's promises are always true, but they are not always fulfilled as we expect. We need to be careful that our expectations do not keep us from seeing the blessings of God. 